Hi, good morning. Welcome to the Windsor Star News Cafe. I'm Don MacArthur here with Dylan Christie and our special guest, uh, Drew Dilkins. He's running for mayor of Windsor. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much, guys. Hey. Pleased to be back. Excellent. Yeah, he, Thanks for coming in. Uh, so you came into the editorial board meeting. Uh, you may have left, uh, maybe not that comfortable. Uh, not sure how that would have turned out, but you did get the endorsement uh, from the Windsor Star's editorial board. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, were you expecting that? Well, no, I wasn't expecting it. I, uh, I think, you know, just I was happy to see that based on what we were talking about mm -hmm. in the campaign, based on the whole package of the uh, of the campaign. So the editorial board, the debates, uh, the individual meetings, all of those things led to that endorsement. And uh, certainly I think it's, a, it, it's an important endorsement and I'm very, very appreciative to have uh, the STARS endorsement for my campaign. Ann Jarvis, of course, she also, uh, you know, came out in favor of you today uh, with some caveats, though. Uh, says, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you might be a good fiscal steward, you can guard the public purse, but you lack vision, you lack dreams. And you yourself have acknowledged that, uh, you know, hey, we just need someone to, a hand on the tiller for the next four years before we can start dreaming big. So do you have some dreams, some visions for Windsor, or is it all just about maintaining what Eddie Francis started? Well, I've been part of the council for the last eight years, so I've been part of the vision that's been uh, delivered for this community, and certainly we still have more work to do. And we've said from the beginning that there's a, a clear choice uh, in this campaign. Do you want to go back, or do you want to keep building on the success that we've had? Uh, so, you know, when I think of vision, uh, you know, people ask, well, what big ideas do you have? And I guess I, I, I somewhat am constrained by the fact that I know what the numbers are, and I know that we can't deliver on another aquatic center, another arena. We can't deliver on these big ticket items over the next four years. But listen, when I think of vision for my community, absolutely I have a vision. Absolutely uh, I want uh, the riverfront connected to the downtown. I want a more active uh, riverfront in our community. I want to build on the neighborhoods that we have. I want to build on the downtown and make it a stronger area. When I read the Windsor Star today and I read the column uh, specifically about small business, you know, that, that kind of hurts me because the whole campaign has really been predicated around creating jobs for the community. I recognize that that's a top priority and uh, a top priority for me in the campaign as well. And, and, and I hear it loud and clear. And when I talk to people at Costco, when I talk to people at Tim Hortons, everywhere I go, it's about jobs. So when I see the comments about small business in the paper, and, and, and we're ranked 80th, I think, out of 106 or 120, uh, that kind of is a, a bit of a knife to my heart, and I want to change that. And my vision would be that we're going to be number one, that I want to do whatever we can to say we're open for business, that we're going to be number one. And at the end of the day, you know, we've, we've built in the last eight years uh, several big ticket items. We got projects done that were outstanding for 20 or 25 years. We took care of that business. And I think that's important. And that was, uh, it really connects to the whole vision of jobs because it helps create that modern progressive community. And it helps when we're attracting physicians. It helps when we're trying to attract business to the community when they say, well, what else do you have? We know your roads and sewers are okay. I mean, or at least on par with, uh, with, with the rest of the rest of the country. That's great. We expect that stuff. Uh, but what else do you have in the community in order to invite and entice people to come here? And, uh, and so we've built those big ticket items that have really led into and, and, and helped help Sandra Pupatello, help the mayor of Windsor go out and sell the community and bring jobs back to this community. So we've done that work. Uh, we've got a vision. And we've, we've, you know, we've, we've started implementing the plan. But when there's a new mayor, you don't want everything just to stop. And I think that was my point, that I'm not the guy who, who wants to go and says everything needs to be changed, you know, we're not on the right track. I think we are on the right track. Mm. I think in a lot of ways we're, we're absolutely on the right track and we got to keep moving and keep the momentum going. And I'm the person who can hit the ground running, who's been part of delivering uh, for this community for the last eight years. You've got the track record, you know where I stand. And, uh, and, and so my vision's quite clear. I want to create jobs for the community. I want to make this community open for business. And I want to start connecting those dots. So the quality of life part, uh, uh, you know, continuing to hold the line on taxes, uh, the infrastructure is obviously important, and continue to diversify the economy. Well, so, and they do mention that in the editorial that um, you do have a full understanding on how council has been able to hold the line on taxes, that your time on council will be invaluable moving forward. Um, but then they do say as well, other than um, they call it an <clears throat> inability to share or to dream big, I guess. Um, that there is a dream on the edge grow. of possible Hadfield yeah, that's right. face, yeah. that there is still Good you concept, are a work in progress but that they have faith in you um, how can you I guess reassure the editorial board reassure voters um, that what the editorial laid out that you may do you may have a uh, inability or to share with voters um, or I guess what do they call it uh, unwillingness or inability to share with voters the vision of how Windsor would change and just open up so what would you do to reassure the editorial board 
Uh, well, listen, I, I, I think we've laid out uh, the plan. We've laid out you know, the vision for the next four years. And, you know, I could say, yes, we'd like to have an indoor soccer field and like we'd, we'd like to have all these, right. you know, amenities. But I know at the end of four years, I couldn't deliver on that because mm -hmm. I know the financial picture. I know the commitments that we've made. And so, uh, you know, I, I believe in this community. I think everyone who runs for mayor believes in their community. I love this city, otherwise I wouldn't be running to be the mayor of the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I see great things. I see the potential that we have as a community. I, I see what we've done as the start of really big things for this community. And I know in the next four years, I believe we need to build on what we've done in the last eight years. Mm -hmm. and, we need, and I think of the airport as an example. The multimodal cargo hub, which we've spent seven years putting that package together finally got the money from the province and the feds and the university's commitment. Everyone came together on that after seven years, but it took almost two terms of council to see that, that vision actually you know, be funded. It's now under construction, and, and when this is built sometime next year, we're going to have to have someone who can take that, you know, who is part of it, and can take it to the next level and make sure that that multimodal cargo hub is functioning effectively, efficiently, and is being filled appropriately, mm -hmm. and connect all those dots that are included there: the university, FedEx, House of Logistics and Management, and the other additions that we're going to need to add. So. I have great hope for this community. I see great things happening in this community. And I know in the next four years, it's about continuity. It's about continuity and being able to continue the momentum that we've, we've, you know, we've delivered for the last eight years and continue to build on that success that we've had. Okay, just on the airport, not to beat this thing to death, but there's still sort of some doubt as to whether or not there's 200 jobs that are available today in Windsor at, at Premier Aviation. Milson says no. And even your answers on this question have always been qualified. There's a big if there if we have the local skilled workforce. Ergo, if we don't have the local skilled workforce, those jobs aren't there, or are they? Here, <clears throat> I thank you for the question. And this is great. I'm glad to have this opportunity to explain where I even came up with a number from. I was invited three, three or three and a half, maybe four weeks ago, in the last month, I was invited to a meeting at Premier Aviation. I had never been inside the plant. I'd been inside the hangar, but not when Premier was there. Never been inside since Premier has been there. The president of Premier Aviation was there, a vice president of operations was there, uh, several councillors uh, were there, uh, other folks who were part of the airport community were there. We had the whole tour, we sat around, and we had a conversation and dialogue with the president of Premier Aviation. During the course of uh, that dialogue, he came out and we had a conversation about what do you need to be successful? What can we do to help you moving forward? He said, I am able to hire 200 people. I want to hire an additional 200 people to build on the success that we're having here now with the 100 people. They had two Boeing 737s in the hangar at the time. But the issue is I can't get the skilled people in the community to come and work here. So I've had to resort to basically hiring a small amount of people that I can afford to hire because when he hires people, they're, they're an, expense off, an expense for him. Right? He can't put them to work directly. And I bring trainers in from Boeing to sit down and, and train these people and put them through the training program. Then they go back out. I may send them to Trois Rivières to have some on-site training there. But it's very expensive to have these people put up in hotels, to ship them around, to have Boeing people come in and train them. And he's doing it in small batches. So he said, there's a skills gap. And it's not, it wasn't something that was foreign to me because I had talked with Mike Soltz at Valiant. And I know they're in-house training as well. They have an in-house training program. Mm -hmm. And Mike says, you know what? We can in-house train people. We can do, give them 40 contact hours if we pay for it ourselves and then hire them. But if they go to St. Clair College, they're going to have roughly, say, 12 to 18 contact hours a week. He said, so it's, it's faster for us to train them in-house. However, it's an expense to us. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something that I hadn't, hadn't heard before with respect to the skills gap and training. So this was really, when I say it was from the President of Premier Aviation's lips to my ears, it was to my ears and, and this whole group of people who were there, and it was through the conversation where he says, I would like to hire 200 people, and that would help me expand this plant and be able to bring more planes in. And the beauty is, it's not just one-time training, it's also ongoing training, because every type of aircraft they bring in there requires different training. So if they have a 737 today, that's one package of training. If tomorrow they want to bring a 747 in, it's a whole other set of training these people have to be certified in. So there'd be a need for ongoing training for quite a long period of time to bring 200 people up to speed on the various types of aircraft that they would like to bring into that facility. Exactly, so there's not 200 job vacancies today. There's the potential for 200 jobs if we get our ducks in a row, cross the T's, dot the I's. But today, if I go in with my resume, he's not hiring. He would like to hire 200 people. That's what he says. I would like to hire 200 people to Exactly. Well, just let me throw this at you. Just, we yeah. needed to hire two reporters here. Mm -hmm. So we threw a net across the country because there was a skills gap in Windsor, the type of skills that we needed 
we, did, you know, we wanted to make sure we could find them. So we cast our net far and wide across the country. We brought in Carolyn Thompson uh, and Derek Spaulding. They live in Windsor now. They work in Windsor now. Uh, they spend their money in the coffee shops, and uh, they want to buy a exactly. TV. They're going to buy it in Windsor. So why doesn't it work that way with Premier? Why can't they say, hey, we need 200 people today. Uh, come here, live in Windsor. It's a beautiful place to live. But it doesn't sound like it's working that way. Well, listen, I, I think part of the answer has to come from Premier. I also understand that, you know, the, these types of MRO facilities are generally located in bigger communities. So you're having to attract them to a smaller community like Windsor. And, uh, and for whatever that's worth, that may be one of the challenges that they're experiencing. But I, I guess my point is, he, sitting there with a group of people, talked about the challenges that he has and what he would like to do in this community and the type of jobs that he would like to bring, this, bring to this community that are well-paying jobs, as I understand, start at $20 an hour, but there are three levels up to the most qualified person who is, who is certified that an aircraft is airworthy uh, and certified by Transport Canada to, to, to make, that, uh, you know, make, that, uh, make that comment and to sign off on the sheets. So he's telling me he wants to hire 200 people. We seem to be getting into a debate on you know, whether he's going to hire 200 or not, and I just keep saying, you know what, why doesn't someone call the president of Premier Aviation and have the same conversation I did because we it tried. seemed to crystallize yeah, to me. <laughs> it crystallized yeah. to me and to everyone else yeah. that was yeah. in the room. Uh, Better yet, uh, Premier Aviation, take out an ad in the classified section <laughs> yes, uh, for yeah, 200 jobs go. in Windsor, and let's, uh, and let's ice this thing, put it to bed. Let's move on, though, to the Auditor General. The sure. star flip-flopped on that. We had an editorial yeah. sort of agreeing with you before, saying, mm -hmm. hey, uh, we don't need an Auditor General. So not to get in the nitty-gritty of yep. you know, all of this, have you softened your uh, position on this? Um, we don't have an Auditor General. Um, should we have an Auditor General? Um, have, have you, has your position changed like this, Star's editorial board, given well, the, the outcry we've heard on the, on the campaign trail? I, I, think, I think what needs to be clarified here is I, I've never said I'm against an Auditor General. In fact, I, I'm one of the ones who agreed to hire the Auditor General in the first place. The facts are there are two municipalities in Ontario out of 444 that have an Auditor General, the City of Toronto and the City of Ottawa. The City of Windsor and the Council of which I was part agreed to hire an Auditor General. We went through an extensive uh, review and, and uh, recruitment. We got to the final strokes of, of a certain, with a certain individual and for whatever reason that didn't work out. And so we had to go back to the drawing board and try and find another qualified candidate. And it was difficult to find the first, the first qualified candidate. We came back uh, the second time, I think it was you know, a year later, we finally found Todd Langlois. He was recommended to us by the Audit Committee. We said, yes, we support Todd Langlois, we hired Todd Langlois. The problem is, and I, I think that the, 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 the confusion in the community and the concern in the community came from the firing of Mr. Langlois, which of course we would not talk publicly about the firing of any employee, and nor would your employer sure. publicly talk about why if they fired you, why they did so. Uh, and, and moreover, there's also a, uh, an agreement in place requested by Mr. Langlois that we, we have confidentiality. Sure. So that created a sense in the community that maybe something was wrong, that we're, he was on to something and that he was, he was terminated. I can tell you clearly that that was not the case. But you have to take my word for it and the word of everyone else around the city council mm -hmm. table that that was not the case. But I get that, that the optics of that <clears throat> didn't look sure. uh, great to the community. So your question is, uh, are you in favor of an Auditor General? I am not against an Auditor General, and the office that we set up when we had Todd Langlois uh, as the Auditor General had him basically managing third-party audits with an independent, public, dispassionate accounting firm. So he was the in-house guy, and then there was a third party doing all the audits. And why we did that is because we thought of the audits of the 400 building, we thought of the audits of the arena, and all the other audits that we've done and the amount of money that we spent. The issue that people were saying is it's taking forever to get the results out. You're spending a lot of money and it's taking forever to get the results out. So we said, well, let's have a hybrid model and be able to get more audits out having this third party uh, deliver on the audits. So when Todd Langlois, was, uh, his, his employment was terminated, uh, we basically said, well, let's carry on and just work with an independent, dispassionate, third party public accounting firm to deliver audits. You know, and so we did that with PricewaterhouseCoopers. They've gone out. They've looked at all of the agencies, boards, and commissions, all of the operations of the city of Windsor, and they have said, here's your audit universe, and then within this audit universe, where are the risk areas? So do you want to audit the International Relations Committee, whose budget is $12,000, or do you want to audit Enwin, whose budget is in the millions of dollars, right? And they've come back and they said, yes, we're going to audit Enwin, and Enwin is scheduled for an audit in 2015. And they've laid out the roadmap on how these things are going to work. So, as I read the Municipal Act, 
uh, I see that the primary difference between the system that we have and having an Auditor General is that PricewaterhouseCoopers is not permitted to issue subpoenas. That's the primary difference. They're not, is not permitted to issue subpoenas. And we know that if there's anything that uh, is, is nefarious, anything that comes out that's problematic, that the police would be involved, that the Crown would be involved, and they have powers to issue uh, subpoenas. Now, that, I've never said I'm against an Auditor General. I'm not. I agreed to hire the first guy in the first place, and if Council, you know, the, the new members of Council wish to bring back the model that we had, I'd support that. I, I have no, no issue with that. You know, and, and I just think when I look at the dollars and cents uh, that we're spending, that we're going to be able to get more audits you know, through the model that we have than if we try and set up an in-house Auditor General's office and have all the legacy costs uh, involved with that. Yeah, well, we've talked before, too. It seems to be mostly about optics right now, um, mm -hmm. that the public will seems to strongly support an Auditor General. And the role of Council and Mayor um, is to represent the will of their voters to a certain extent, right? So if everyone's pushing for an Auditor General, would it not help? Because there are, it's more than just waiting for something bad to happen to the Auditor General's role, which I'm sure PricewaterhouseCoopers does as well, is to look for cost-efficient um, solutions as well, right? And catch which it is, before you call the cops. That's yeah, exactly, like that's you don't want to have the cops call in. in, in you know, and, so. and I get that, guys, and that's why when you look at uh, the schedule that's set up, you know, for instance, with mm -hmm. Enwin 2015, there's nothing wrong at Enwin. Like yeah. there's no, there's nothing that that warrants having an audit independently at Enwin. But they're going ahead and they're saying this is a risk area because of the volume of of, of dollars that are involved. We're going to go ahead and have the audit at Enwin. So okay. this is happening. It's it's unrolling right now. It's not, uh, you know, no one's waiting for it to happen. It, it they've set out the roadmap. They're following the roadmap. It will happen. And you know what? We look forward to the results. Yeah. We were paying them when we look forward to having the results. And if Enwin's absolutely clean, fantastic. If there are things that come up at Enwin that uh, you know, show that there are value for money uh, issues that mm -hmm. we can improve on, I pay the same bills. Yeah. I mean, if we find value for money, I would appreciate knowing how we can make the service better and improve the service because I, I pay the same bills that everyone else pays. Well, that's the other thing, though, and not to be to death, but I don't think the can PricewaterhouseCoopers, I don't think they can do value for money. Isn't absolutely. The general can no, do value for PricewaterhouseCoopers okay. can do performance audits, value for money audits, and if we really want them to do, we can have them do forensic audits, which are the most expensive okay. uh, type of audits to do. But let's, you know, this is really important because there's a budget set for the Auditor General's office, and I just, I think it's important to say this, that the budget that's set if the Auditor General himself, if we had Todd Langways here or any other Auditor General, and they said, you know what, uh, Enwin, as an example, needs a forensic audit, mm -hmm. the most expensive type of audit, and they say that audit's going to cost a uh, million dollars or a million and a half dollars because these are all very expensive audits to do. They would still have to come to City Council for funding. They don't have the unilateral authority to just say, yeah, we have unlimited budget and we're just going to go ahead and spend. They would still need the authority from City Council to expend those dollars the same way they price Waterhouse Coopers would need the same authority from City Council to expend those dollars if it goes over and above the budget that's allocated. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. All right. Uh, fair enough. We got to put a bow on this thing, Drew. That's so, it. Uh, yeah. Well, where are um, <laughs> so Monday? Where are you gonna? We were gonna give you a chance too, but on Monday you're gonna go vote. Where are you gonna vote? Uh, my voting station is South Windsor Arena. We'll be okay. there at 11 a.m. Okay. Uh, to vote, and I look forward to it. It's been a it's been a fun campaign. It's been an interesting campaign. It's certainly been different uh, running for mayor than it ever was running for city council. Uh, but I can tell you that I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and and uh, and I've met some great people and had some great experiences, and some not so good experiences too along the way. <laughs> but uh, it. it's all part of it, right? And and at the end of the day, I think I'm I'm better for having having done this. I'm proud to have uh, put my name out to to represent my community. And I know that I'm ready to lead, that this would be a seamless transition, we'd be able to hit the ground running. And at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's about, my campaign is about building on success. I think we've had a lot of success as a community uh, over the last eight years, and I'm prepared to continue to take it to the next level. Okay, uh, Drew Dilkins, he got endorsed this morning by the Windsor Stars editorial board, also endorsed uh, by Ann Jarvis, with caveats. It's caveats, yes. Okay, uh, and <laughs> Vander Dolan's endorsement, uh, it comes tomorrow. Uh, Drew, uh, thanks for joining us on Trail Tuck Talk. Uh, good luck in the election. and. Uh, Boom, we're in the Windsor Star News Cafe. Thanks, guys.